Hey everyone, Ranger William here, back again with another episode of Covered with Flame and Smoke, Weapons and Tactics at the Battle of Kings Mountain, October 7th, 1780. What we're looking at with this is a very detailed, in-depth look at those weapons and tactics that are described in eyewitness accounts of this battle or found through battlefield archaeology. Now, the reason we're doing this is to gain a fuller understanding of how this battle happened. Um, this battle was described by both sides as being a major turning point in the American Revolution. But how was this battle even possible? You have a, a bunch of backwoods frontier militia take on their neighbors and friends, loyalist militia, but led by a great British officer. He's been training these guys, arming and equipping these guys. They have a very strong position on top of Kings Mountain, and they're almost wiped out. How was this possible? So we're going to dive in here and talk in episode two about some of the most iconic weapons, the smoothbore musket and the flintlock rifle. Now, back in episode one, if you missed that, you can go back and check it out. We talked a little bit about the backstory of the battle, the story of the Overmountain men, the Overmountain victory trail. We talked about... Um, kind of the Patriots moving into position around Ferguson's ridgetop camp, the conditions they've been under the past couple days. They're tired, they're wet, they're hungry, um, and they really only have enough ammunition for one good fight. And we talked a little bit about the gunpowder. How do these weapons work? Flintlocks, um, different gunpowder uh combustion rates. Uh, we talked about the projectiles they're using, um, all lead, round ball, just different sizes. And now is when we're going to really get into our episode here of uh, muskets versus rifles. Now, let's talk a little bit about muskets. Um, when Patrick Ferguson is given his kind of his task, his assignment as inspector of Southern militia, he is told to issue ammunition to the loyalists and arms to those who do not have one. Now, there are a few records of about 300 French muskets being uh, given to Ferguson for these men, and these could come from a few different places. Um, these could come from either uh, intercepted French arms shipments caught by the British Royal Navy crossing the Atlantic Ocean, or you've seen some big British victories the past summer in May and August of 1780, especially when uh, continental troops, French armed troops, are captured. So maybe some of those weapons are what are being given to Ferguson to now give to his loyalists. Now you also see old British uh, longland pattern muskets in their loyalist hands, uh, maybe some British shortland pattern muskets, um, but let's talk about muskets here. Now one of the main differences between the musket and the rifle is going to be inside the barrel. The barrel here on your musket is just a smooth metal tube. Think of it kind of like a modern day shotgun. It's just a smooth metal barrel and it's usually going to be a little bit larger than your um, than your hunting rifles. Um, these are going to be anywhere from a about a 65, 69 caliber with kind of the French made muskets up to a 75, 77 or 80 caliber with the British musket. Now, these were designed to be uniform in size. So your British muskets are going to be the same size barrel. The French are going to be the same. The German muskets or the Dutch muskets are going to be the same. And that's going to allow for uh, use of cartridges. What that means is the ammunition used by these weapons is all going to be the same size. Um, it's going to be a paper tube closed off on one end with a, a musket ball, maybe some buckshot in there on top of it with a pre-measured amount of gunpowder. That means the soldier can grab one of these paper cartridges, tear it open, be able to load his weapon from that pre-measured amount and be able to fire. With enough training and practice, he can do this in about 10 to 12 seconds. Um, so it's going to be a very big advantage on the battlefield. Now, there is going to be one difference, though, is that the, um, the musket ball issued for these weapons is usually going to be smaller than the barrel. Uh, the reason for this, we talked in episode one about the residue that's left behind from this gunpowder, from all this gun smoke. Well, that residue is going to build up not just on the external surface of the weapon where you have the flint striking the hammer, but it's going to build up inside the barrel, this fouling. Uh, after several shots, that residue is going to build up and actually make it tighter inside the barrel. So if you did have a properly fitting round lead ball that was the exact size of your barrel, 
once that residue builds up, you would not be able to pack it in and load it from the muzzle. You would have to stop in the middle of combat, clean out your barrel, and then you can resume loading. The British government, many uh, traditional governments, they did not like that. That took too long. That was dangerous to their men. So by issuing them a slightly smaller ball, once that residue builds up, they can still force that musket ball down, reload, and continue to fight. Now let's talk about the British issued muskets. Um, in the short land pattern and the long land pattern, um, we, there is no documentation for the term the Brown Bess musket being used in this time. Um, that comes a little bit later. There's actually a um, at some soldier slang from the later 1780s, 1790s, where to marry Brown Bess meant to go be a soldier. Um, that's the only thing that I can find that really has these being called the Brown Best Musket. Um, but short land and long land would have been the uh, the terms of the time. Um, but this weapon is going to be about a 75 caliber barrel. Now, for those who aren't familiar with what this term means, the 75 caliber, um, what that means is that you are measuring in inches, you are measuring the diameter of that barrel. So a 75 caliber actually means a 0 0.75 inch. So that means a 75 caliber, 0 0.75 inches, is three quarters of an inch across. And firing a 69 caliber ball would be a 0 0.69 of an inch. So just under 7 tenths of an inch across is the diameter of the ball. Now that's going to be the main projectile with these. Um, and I mentioned some buckshot earlier when you're inside that cartridge, usually 25 to 32 caliber, three to four pieces of buckshot packed inside. There have been a few muskets that have been found in um, archaeological findings, uh, especially shipwrecks that are still loaded. They've been able to x-ray the barrel and you can see that main musket ball and the pieces of buckshot in there with it. Now, the French main muskets, like those 300 that were issued to Patrick Ferguson, are going to be a little smaller, um, usually about a 65 to a 69 caliber barrel and a 62 caliber ball. And then you have the, the known Dutch muskets or German muskets. I like the one pictured here up at the top. Um, uh, from the Smithsonian, credited with being captured from a loyalist at the battle, um, is going to be a lot larger. It's actually going to be about a 77 to an 80 caliber, so eight tenths of an inch across is going to be that barrel there. And now there is going to be some slight, uh, slight variation um, in your musket balls. These are hand cast. Um, the tools that they're using are handmade, so a little variation is to be expected. Uh, for example, 15 musket balls that were recovered from Lexington Battlefield in Massachusetts. Um, they vary from about a 64 caliber to a 70 caliber. Um, and then for those who are familiar with the weight of these measuring by grains, um, these musket balls varied anywhere from a 364 grain to 483 grain. That gives you an idea of kind of how heavy these lead projectiles were. Um, so again, to kind of just recap with some of the benefits that you've got here, it's a slightly smaller ball, which means you can load faster, 10 to 12 seconds. Um, these are made very sturdy as well. You'll notice kind of nice thick wooden stocks, metal reinforcement at different places. So it's very useful in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, the end of the barrel, if you can kind of see where I'm pointing here, the end of the barrel is exposed. There is no wooden stock along, you know, all the way to the end of the muzzle. That's going to allow you to fit a bayonet. Oh, we'll talk about the bayonets a little bit later, um, but also their uniform calibers. So you can issue the pre-made ammunition, those cartridges to just tear them open, load quickly. Um, you have a bit of a spray effect with these fire uh, because you have that musket ball and those several pieces of buckshot on top. Um, Let's see what else uh, that, that uh, issued ammunition is also going to mean that the gunpowder is uniform. So, you know, it's good quality. You know, it's going to work. So there's a little bit of the uh, the benefits of the musket. Let's talk about a major negative side effect is going to be the accuracy. Uh, like we've been talking about, that slightly smaller lead ball is great when that residue builds up inside the barrel, makes a tighter fit, makes it hard to reload. But until that tightness is achieved, that ball is going to be inside a loose, smooth metal tube. So when you fire that weapon, um, that is going to kind of have a bit of a ricochet effect as it travels down the barrel, kind of like a, like a wobble. Um, to use kind of a, a baseball metaphor or analogy, um, think of it like a uh, throwing a knuckleball instead of a fastball. 
that knuckleball is kind of like wobbling through the air there because it's not cutting as straight as clean as it could be. Now, military manual is going to talk about the problem of this this wobble. Um, this means that uh, even though you have enough velocity with that ball to do damage to strike your target up to 300 yards away, according to period uh, engineering manuals, um, the problem at that distance is going to be your accuracy because just a slight variation, a slight ricochet when it leaves the muzzle, by the time it gets one to 200 yards down range, it's going to mean that ball has traveled quite a bit off of a straight path and you may not hit your target. Uh, one British officer who served with Ferguson for a while, George Hanger, um, he was a noted sportsman, marksman, fascinated with guns. Uh, he says that a, a soldier firing a smoothbore musket at a man-sized target about 200 yards away, uh, Hanger says he may as well be firing at the moon. At 200 yards, that ball is going to travel enough that you will not be able to hit a man-sized silhouette. He says with proper practice, 100 yards, absolutely, you're accurate. But once you get kind of beyond that, your individual, one musket, one target, your individual accuracy is going to suffer. Uh, that is why one of the main tactics that you see used during this time with these weapons is going to be linear combat and volley fire. Um, that means you're having your entire company fire at a, the same time, creating a wall of lead projectiles, a wall of gunfire going down range. At that point, um, usually fighting against another similarly lined up company, it does not matter if your one musket ball hits your one target, as long as it hits something, someone down range. Um, and this is where that speed really comes into effect. If both sides are using these weapons, so both sides are arranged in similar formations, it then becomes a question of, well, who can fire the fastest? So that's where you get this idea of using those, uh, those buckshot, as well as being able to have that 10 second reload time. Uh, for example, uh, this goes from you know one man being able to fire uh, that one musket ball, uh, we'll say four buckshot, so five projectiles, every uh, 15, we'll say 15 seconds. Well, if he's in a company of 100 men, that means 500 projectiles every 16, every 15 seconds. Uh, that is a lot of lead going down range. And hopefully you can kind of work your work in a little bit closer, weakening the enemy, um, either killing or wounding enough of their soldiers that you can finally drive them off the battlefield. So there was a big a negative side effect, that loss of accuracy with the musket. However, they um, kind of countered that negative with the volley tactics. Now, another negative side effect here is going to be uh, that space around the ball. Um, it's going to allow some of the explosive gases, some of the, uh, the force of that explosion to escape. So when you're looking at kind of um, <clears throat> looking at uh, velocity, looking at force, um, there were some tests conducted uh, by, by Lucien Haig. Um, these were conducted using a 72 caliber British musket using a, a very proper fitting, about a 0.718 caliber ball and 100 grains of 2F gunpowder. Um, so when you're looking at your gunpowder rating system, you have uh, 1, 2, and 3F. Um, that's going to be the, the fineness of the grain, the fineness of the size of the pieces. The smaller the grains of gunpowder, uh, the more mixed they're going to be, the better they're going to combust. Uh, so trying to kind of mimic what a soldier would be issued, and they use 2F powder here. Now, the result of that fire was about 951 feet per second when that ball left the muzzle. 951 feet per second with just over 1,100 foot-pounds of force. So that's going to be that one ball traveling out. Now, by the time that ball has reached 200 yards, that velocity has dropped from 951 to 668 feet per second, and your, your force has almost almost half has, 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 has lost, uh, from 1,100 foot-pounds to 547 foot-pounds. They've also noted a drop of 100 inches over those 200 yards. So that means if you're going to want to try and hit, talking about being able to hit a man-sized target, if you're going to want to hit a spot at 200 yards distance, that soldier is going to have to find a, a spot about eight feet above the target and aim for that. 
to be able to effectively drop that ball those 100 inches onto his target from 200 yards away. So to summarize your musket here, it's fast loading. It's a large caliber, got a bit of a spray of buckshot. Um, you have the ability to put a bayonet on the end. We'll talk about that a little more in our hand-to-hand -hand combat episode. Um, but it's most effective in volley tactics, lined up, firing together, walls of lead flying towards the enemy. So you have uh, British muskets, the shortland pattern, the longland pattern. You have a few German and Dutch muskets being used by the Loyalists. Those 300 intercepted or captured French muskets being issued out to the Loyalist troops. And also you have some of these in hands of the Patriots. Uh, notably, Thomas Young talks about firing his old musket during the battle when he actually would put two musket balls in at a single time. Now to counter that, um, on the other side of the argument here, you have your musket and now you have your rifle. Now, rifles are going to be one of those other kind of uh, iconic American Revolution weapons. Uh, now, they're not called the Kentucky rifle yet, um, partly because Kentucky is not a, not a state. Um, that's going to be more of a thing from the War of 1812. At this time, you're going to be called Pennsylvania rifles or long rifles, rifled guns, rifled muskets sometimes. Um, but this idea is not an American idea. It's not even an American invention. Um, these things, um, they go back into the late 16th century Germany. What you see happen is um, when German immigrants... Uh, when they immigrate to the colonies, especially to Pennsylvania, they're going to bring this idea with them, this idea of inside the rifle barrel. It's a it's a thicker walled barrel, and you're going to carve uh, spiraling grooves into that metal barrel. And this is going to fire a very tight fitted round ball, again, the same, sh same shape projectile as the musket, but those tight grooves are going to grip that ball, causing it to spin, causing it to spiral as it travels down the barrel. So when it leaves the muzzle and begins flying across the battlefield, that spin is going to allow it to kind of cut through the air much more efficiently. So think of it back to the baseball analogy, um, the knuckleball versus the fastball. That fastball having that spin cutting through that air, much straighter course and much more speed. Um, now, the problem, though, when you have uh, trying to bring this technology over and make this in America, you don't have the same level of industry set up. You're not able to have that uh, uh, some uh, German rifles of the time um, used effectively by the uh, the Jaeger Corps, um, part of the Hessians, the Brunswickers, um, part of the British Army. Um, their rifles are going to be shorter barrels, very thick, heavy barrels um, with those, those nice tight spiral grooves cut in. Uh, the German immigrants aren't able to copy that same level of industry, so they elongate the barrel so that they're able to get their one or one and a half rotations of those spiraling grooves. Um, and that is the birth of the long rifle right there. They couldn't make the same short heavy barrel, so they lengthened it out, uh, still kind of heavy, but they lengthened the barrel to get that rotation. Now. Uh, I mentioned they have a, a very tight fitted round lead ball um, and made even more tight by usually wrapping that one ball in a piece of greased cloth. Uh, it's going to help it slide down when you're trying to force it down the barrel. Um, and not only does that give you a grip on those uh, rifle grooves, but it's also going to trap more of that explosive gas, trap more of that gunpowder force behind that ball. So going back to some of our uh, technical ballistic tests, Dave Ehring of the uh, National Muzzle Loading Rifle Association, uh, director of the Long Hunter Society of that organization, he conducted some tests using a 50 caliber rifle. Uh, most of your rifles by the Revolution are somewhere around there, a 45 to a 60 caliber. Um, so you're looking uh, uh, roughly around around about a half inch diameter. Um. I'm also talking about our, our tests with the uh, gunpowder, our grading system of 1, 2, and 3F. Um, Dave conducted some tests using 100 grains of 2F, uh, similar to those other musket tests we talked about, but he also tried using only 90 grains of 3F. So less gunpowder, but a finer grind. Uh, that would actually give you a, a faster combustion rate. But using this test, um, has about 1,800 feet per second. So right out the muzzle, you're looking at seven, six, 700 feet per second faster than the musket ball. 
and 1,300 foot-pounds of force. So I believe it's about 1, 200 pounds more than you had back with the musket. So you see that smaller ball, but tighter fitting inside the barrel, trapping more of that force, coming out faster with more force behind it. Now, in another series of tests done by some other researchers, looking at the effect um, that accuracy has on you know, different kinds of uh, gunpowder loads and projectiles, um, it was discovered that having a smaller caliber ball, another reason that it would kind of travel more accurately is it's smaller, so you have less drag resistance from the air and uh, less surface to uh, resistance, less friction once it hits the target. So when you're looking at, for example, they fired into uh, blocks of ballistics gel, that smaller rifle ball would travel deeper. Um, so when you're looking at a hunting scenario or a combat scenario, this can mean the difference between a, a killing your target or just wounding that extra, that um, the deeper penetration of that smaller rifle ball. So you're looking at stabilized flight from those spiraling rifle grooves, the tighter fit in the barrel with the, that tight patch, um, trapping more of those forces, and then you have that smaller projectile. This is gonna be a perfect weapon for long range accurate fire. Now, um, let's talk about size again. We talked about about 45 to a 65 caliber. Um, there is another kind of civilian weapon we're gonna mention really quick here called a Fowler. That's actually one that you see pictured behind me at the Smith McDowell house, a, a smooth bore hunting weapon. So this is gonna be uh, not as loose fitting as a musket. Um, it doesn't have those spiraling grooves of the rifle, but it is another kind of uh, common popular civilian hunting gun. There were nine Fowler balls discovered at Lexington Battlefield, and those varied from about a 45 to a 65 caliber there. So the same caliber that you see with rifles. Um, and especially talking about rifles, while we're talking about pictures, the, uh, the, the picture above where you have those three rifle stocks laying there with their nice um, uh, patch boxes on the stock, their rifle locks lined up nice. These were all made by the same person. Um, different accounts from Kings Mountain veterans collected by Lyman Draper again for his, uh, his 1880 book, Kings Mountain and its Heroes. He talks about Jacob Dickert or Deckert or Deckard, uh, spelled a few different ways in different sources, but he noted that Jacob's rifles were kind of known for being uh, very well made. They were highly prized in your frontier over mountain settlements where these Patriots are coming from. So here we actually have three of Jacob Dickert's rifles that were on display back at the um, Eastern Pennsylvania Long Rifle Show back in 2019. Um, so we talked a little bit about the rifles there. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the, the negative side effects. Um, yes, you have greater accuracy. Uh, my little graphic here showing those uh, kind of spiraling grooves, making that ball spiral as it flies through the air. But what's going to be a problem with these civilian made, kind of custom personally made hunting weapons is a variety of calibers. Again, a 45 to a 65 was quite common to see that kind of range, that, that variety. This means that you cannot issue a group of militia or riflemen, you cannot issue them pre-made ammunition, pre-made cartridges. Um, this means that um, they're going to have a variety of rifle ball. They're going to have to each man make and carry his own, not only his own ammunition, but his own tools to make his ammunition. His gunpowder cannot be pre-measured, but it's going to have to be carried inside his powder horn with a little measure attached to it. Um, this means in the battle, he's going to have to find that loose ball, force it down that tight-fitting barrel. He's going to have to measure the gunpowder from his horn into the measure, into the barrel. This is going to take precious moments when you're in combat. Um, you're not worried about this when you're out hunting. You're not worried about uh, a turkey suddenly charging you with a fixed bayonet. But when you're in close quarters combat, uh, some of the accounts that Kings Mountain talk about 20 to 30 yards away from the enemy, when you're in this kind of close combat, those moments matter. Um, so you're going to have a very good weapon for long range, but not great when it comes to speedy, quick firing. But let's talk about that accuracy a little bit more. Let's go back to the, the good things about the rifle, right? 
Um, we talked about George Hanger saying that a musket man could not hit a target if it was 200 yards away. It would be like firing at someone on the moon. Meanwhile, a British captain serving, uh, I believe it was in New Jersey, um, he talks about how the American riflemen prefer to engage at 200 yards because they can hit their targets just fine and they know they are beyond the accurate range of a single musket shot. So when they're skirmishing with British sentries and pickets, that's their preferred distance. Um, looking at some other accounts of rifle accuracy, going back a couple years to when the revolution first began in 1775, you have... Um, Daniel Morgan, later of Saratoga fame, of Cal uh, Calpens fame, when he first recruits a group of Virginia riflemen to travel up to the siege of Boston in the summer of 1775, the test that he is giving to this company is to place two shots through a seven inch circle at 205, 250 yards away with no rest or no assistance um, at first try. And a force of 96 men was quickly recruited. It said. So you're looking at these guys, two shots, one after another, into a seven inch circle, 250 yards away. I mean, if you hold up a six inch sub at 250 yards, I'm not sure I could even see it. Uh, so these guys are easily putting shots on target. Um, these guys are going to earn a reputation as being expert marksmen at the battlefields of Boston, Quebec, Saratoga, and throughout the revolution. Now, another account from Virginia talks about these guys. They say on September 9th, 1775, the Virginia Gazette publishes an account where it says, quote, a man held between his knees, a board five inches wide, seven inches long, with a paper bull's eye the size of a dollar, I mean a dollar coin. And another rifleman, 60 yards away without rest, put eight bullets in succession through the bull's eye, end quote. So what you have happening, these riflemen, as they're traveling on their way to join the Continental Army, putting on shooting exhibitions, showing off their skills, impressing the locals. Um, these are going to be the same kinds of riflemen that are going to be seen on the battlefield, and especially here in the South. Uh, George Hanger, again, talking about shooting at the moon. Um, he becomes fascinated by these riflemen. He, in fact, is going to get it. Uh, he's going to get chances to interview captured Patriot riflemen. He wants to ask them, what can they do? How can they do this? He's going to write about this um, after the war. He's going to write this one pamphlet in particular uh, called Colonel George Hanger to all sportsmen and particularly to farmers and gamekeepers. Now, he writes this in 1815, reminiscing about the kind of things he's picked up in his life. Um, and he tells this one story about a rifleman he encounters in the Southern campaign of the revolution. He says that he and another officer were sitting mounted on a, hill, a hillside looking about 400 yards away at some woods. And he noticed that there was a, um, there was a man out there and he says, well, we should maybe move before he tries to take a shot at us. He says about that time, he saw a puff of smoke and the man who was kind of mounted back behind them, uh, his horse kind of perpendicular to theirs, says, sir, my horse is hit and his horse dropped down, hit by that man's shot 400 yards away. So after that little skirmish that ensued, he measured and remeasured and was astonished at 400 yards away. Uh, he says in some of these other interviews with prisoners, quote, they have replied that they thought they were generally sure of splitting a man's head at 200 yards, for so they termed their hitting the head. I have also asked several whether they could hit a man at 400 yards. They have replied, certainly, or shoot very near him, end quote. So to summarize the rifle, you're looking at a slow loading, um, about 45 seconds, 30 seconds per shot, having to measure the gunpowder, get that tight fitted ball pack down there. A very slow loading weapon, but very accurate. You're looking at a smaller caliber usually than your larger 60, 70 caliber muskets. You're looking at a single aimed ball, that one rifle shot compared to that musket ball and buck shot that you get from the musket. And no hand to hand fixtures. Um, if you notice in my little graphic here, the, uh, the stock runs all the way to the end of the muzzle. 
This is very usual for a rifle. These aren't designed to fit a bayonet and fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, so no hand-to-hand -hand ability. Um, also, they're made very elegantly, trying to remove any extra weight from the wooden stock. So using it as a club would usually result in a broken rifle. So they're most effective at long-range fire, accurate fire, skirmishing, hunting, not so much in quick, close combat. But we're to wrap up our time today with a discussion of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, we've mentioned the musket's ability to fit a bayonet. Uh, this great painting here from Jean-Baptiste Antoine de Vergere. Um, this is in the Anne S.K. Brown collection at Brown University. This is a, a, a painting that is done by a French soldier at the Siege of Yorktown in October 1781, just about a year, a little over a year after our battle here at Kings Mountain. But you'll note that he shows a couple of different kinds of American troops that he saw. So on the far side here, the far left, you've got these two soldiers, white and brown coats. You're going to have them with their muskets by their side at order arms with their bayonets fixed, a nice long 14 to 16 inch blade. This is a triangular shaped blade fitted over the muzzle so you can still load, you can still fire, but it does turn your weapon into a hand-to-hand a -hand combat, almost like a spear. Um, now the rifle doesn't have that ability. You can't fit a bayonet on top of it. So our rifleman here with his, his feathery hat, uh, you notice kind of tucked into the his back there, tucked into either a belt or somehow attached to his, his bag and his powder horn, you have a hatchet or a tomahawk. Um, these riflemen are going to be forced to use hand-held weapons. Now, this other picture here behind me is actually believed to be Isaac Shelby's hatchet. Now, we're not sure if it's from the American Revolution or his service later in the War of 1812, um, but this is believed to be Isaac Shelby's hatchet, again, with uh, his powder horn, one of these items you have to carry for that gunpowder, the loose gunpowder to measure for your rifle. And when you look at the... Um, the 910 hand-picked Patriot Frontiersmen, these guys who begin to kind of envelop and just surround Kings Mountain. Uh, a few of them are carrying muskets, uh, but the majority of them are going to be using their hunting guns, the rifles, the, uh, the Fowlers I mentioned, these kind of personal hunting guns, and the Loyalists on top of that ridge. The Loyalist force, about 11, 1200 strong, we know they contain hunting guns as well as military muskets. Now the military muskets, um, again those larger caliber, fast loading, these are made even more lethal in the battle because of who it is that's carrying them. Not only do you have these issued out to Loyalist militia, but you have about uh, 80 to 90 trained Loyalist Provincials. These are going to be men who came with Ferguson from New York City, volunteers who chose to come on this little special mission. Uh, they are trained in this uh, rapid reload, volley fire, and bayonet fighting, so they know what they're going to be doing. Now, one legend collected by Draper in the 19th century says that Patrick Ferguson, he sees the problem of his Loyalist militia, those with the hunting guns, not being able to engage in hand-to-hand in combat as effectively as his musket carrying troops. So he has them uh, take their hunting knives, whittle down the handles so they can jam them, stuff them into the rifle barrel, turning it into kind of like a, uh, a musket and bayonet situation. They would not be able to load and fire with this knife jammed into the barrel, but they could remove it later on when it was safe to resume their slower reloading, but their accurate fire. Now, another version of this story has Patrick Ferguson stopping at different blacksmiths, different ironworks, as he travels through the Carolinas and having the blacksmiths make these special long hunting knives with, uh, with handles that could fit inside the rifle barrel. So I have yet to find any um, primary sources, any 18th century sources describing these. Um, just we have the, uh, the recollections collected in the 19th century. Um, so the legend needs a little bit of sorting out there. But why is Patrick Ferguson doing this? If Ferguson is an experienced light infantry officer. He has used bayonets very effectively in combat. He's also an expert marksman. He's aware of the shortcomings of traditional tactics in untraditional environments. Uh, Ferguson, and he sees the benefits that his militia bring to the table. Uh, he, when he writes about them to Lord Cornwallis, he says that when they are properly officered and disciplined, he says that they, quote, are very fit for rough and irregular war, being all excellent, excellent woodsmen, unerring shots, careful to a degree to prevent waste or damage to, to their ammunition, quote. 
So you see Ferguson respecting his militia. He likes their abilities in the woods, and they are going to have, um, according to this legend, some of these little homemade bayonets with them there. So there you have the weapons. You have muskets, you have rifles, you have fast loading, you have slow loading. You have kind of inaccurate, deadly accurate. Bayonets in combat, hand to hand with a hatchet or a knife. Um, very different weapons here, but on both sides. So this has been episode two of Covered with Flame and Smoke, looking at the weapons and tactics of the Battle of Kings Mountain, October 7th, 1780. Go back, check out episode number one, talking about flintlocks, talking, talking about the background to our story, talking about gunpowder. Here you have episode two about the actual weapons, and check out episode three and beyond as we get into some of the detailed eyewitness accounts of combat. What was Kings Mountain like? What really happened there? How should we really remember this? So again, I'm Ranger William from the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail. I hope you enjoyed our program today. Thanks for watching.